Hey everyone, my guest today is Sebak Ohanyan, screenwriter and producer. Hi Sebak, how are you? Hi Sona, good to be here, thank you. It's nice to see you. Okay, so you were just included in Hollywood Reporter's list of 35 rising executives under 35. How does that feel? Uh, it feels good. I barely, I barely uh, made it right before it was too late for me because I'm 34. But uh, it feels great. Um, you know, I mean, it was especially nice because my sister is also on the list. Uh, you know, which is which, which they told me is the is the first time it has ever happened in the history of the Hollywood Reporter doing this list. And it's especially exciting because Rommel and I, you know, we're both in the industry, but we literally never work together. Like there's zero, like what they call nepotism. And <laughs> that's something that exists a lot in this industry, as I'm sure you can imagine famous actors, you know, give birth to other future famous actors. But it's just the irony that like Rommel and I, who have a very humble, you know, upbringing, my, you know, my mom's an accountant with the LAUSD, and our father is a, is a contractor, you know, who, who builds houses. We now are two Ohanians on this, like, you know, fancy list of executives. It almost feels like we're like this, like, I remember somebody was upset about it. They're like, hey, man, like, what are you guys all like, all the Ohanians are taking over? I'm like, no, man, literally, it's just us, like, it's just the two of us. But um, no, it's really cool. I think these, these things are silly, but um, it, is, it is nice to be recognized. And again, it was so special because of Rumble too. And then they probably assume that you're also related to Alexis Ohanian, right? Uh, I get that a lot. And it's funny, I finally had a chance to meet the guy not too long ago. And he's, he's obviously the coolest guy ever. And it was, uh, it's funny, he, I think he even tweeted it or something saying like, see, my cousins are amazing, but just, just adding to the confusion, but no, no relation. Okay, so is it true that you got your start with YouTube videos? Yeah, I, isn't that crazy? Uh, when I was growing up in LA, uh, I ended up moving to Glendale when we were in high school, where I went to Herbert Hoover High School. I love film. Like it was genuinely something I had a passion for, but I was nervous about pursuing it as an actual career because, you know, speaking of which, like there's no Armenians in the industry. Like it's hard to break in, especially if you don't come from, you know, like some kind of established, you know, family or whatever already. And I was, like I said, I was weary to pursue filmmaking, but while I ended up going to college for journalism at UC San Diego, I just started making little YouTube videos just for fun with my friends. And like, you know, the first video we made, was my buddy who was always getting in trouble with his dad. And he would always tell us stories about, oh my God, my dad yelled at me yesterday and here's what he said. And, and we were just always laughing. So we're like, let's just make a little video with this. Shot that video literally with my dad's own video camera. And we put it on YouTube. And I remember this so well. So it was 2007. I uploaded the video on YouTube, took like two hours, <laughs> you know, back then. And I went to get a haircut. And obviously I didn't have an iPhone or anything like that. An hour or two later, I came home and I was expecting the video to have maybe three views. Cause like, I just sent it to one or two people to my shock. It had almost a thousand. And this was like way back when, like before videos were going viral. And I was like a thousand views. This is like the most views anyone will ever, like it was, you know, way before a million, million views and stuff. The video was so popular that people were sharing it in Armenia, in other countries. Um, you know, my friends were getting spotted in Glendale. They were like, wait a minute, are you that guy? Like it was crazy. So we had to follow up. So we made a second video. Uh, this time I brought my sister Ramallah in it. And it was only because I was like, oh, we're gonna make a little video one night. Uh, who do I know who could play a young Armenian girl? And it was, you know, somewhat inspired by my family. Obviously, I thought of Ramallah, who has no desire to be an actor, but she did it. And we put the video this time, the video was about the mom. So we had my same friend dress up as a mom. And we shot this video, same home video camera, one night. If you've seen the video, so I know like the, half the time the video is like going like this because I'm laughing while I'm holding the camera and it's so cheap. But uh, that video went viral. And then I was, uh, I was like trying to think of like, what else can I do with these videos? And I figured like, why not make an entire movie? And I had bought or I had pirated illegally the filmmaking software that you write screenplays on called Final Draft. I literally just taught myself how to how to write a movie. And in my mind, I was like, oh yeah, I guess you have to have a beginning, a middle and end, and there should be these characters and stuff like that. So I wrote this movie with the theme being uh, an Armenian family in which the kids are Americanized teenagers and the parents are like old fashioned, you know, like Armenians from the old country. And that culture clash that happens between them 
and how it reaches a boiling point over a weekend family trip to Palma Springs, obviously Palm Springs. So a lot of this is inspired by my life. Spent the entire summer shooting this, this, like this movie. Our first day we got cops pulled up and pointed guns at us because we were shooting in Santa Clarita at 4 a.m. And we were making a lot of noise because it was a big emotional scene of the dad yelling in Armenian in a street. I had no clue. What am I doing? Like there's people who are sleeping here in this like rich neighborhood. And then as we were packing up to go like home finally, like at 4 a.m., these cop cars started coming down the street. This is day one. And the cop cars are coming and I was like, all right, well, like, let me talk to them. I'll explain. We're just making little, little, you know, student film or whatever. But the cops, they didn't just pull up. They like screeched to a halt busted open the doors pointed guns freeze we're like what the hell and it's like only because i think santa Cruz is a little bit of a white community that was hearing these like foreign languages being yelled and they grabbed us they threw us on a thing and then when my friend edge came out he was still wearing the fake boobs and the bra they almost shot him so like what is this guy um and luckily they let us go away but it was uh it was an interesting first day and we ended up shooting the entire movie like that it was i said this all the time i wrote it i directed it i shot it I edited it. I did every job except for makeup, but then the makeup artist quit. So I did that too. It was not the best makeup. And when it was done, um, we, uh, we screened it at Glendale high school. We sold tickets. Um, and then we sold DVDs and I'll never forget that first night. It was July 12, 2008. Like we had 4,000 people in one night at Glendale high school, watching this movie, clapping, cheering, like, no, I'm sorry, it was 1300 people per screening. We did four screenings and like, they were crying, they were laughing, they were, it was like madness to me because it was like something that I had thought of and I wrote on like the software. And, and that was the moment I realized like that empowered me to want to pursue filmmaking, knowing that if, you know, if I can inspire four to 5,000 strange Armenians, like strange Armenians to come and support something, maybe I can have a proper career. But yes, long way of saying it all started with YouTube videos. This story is significant for so many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons that I shoot these episodes of High Brand is because I want people often know stories about how people um, work in the industry once they've already made it, but they don't really understand what were the proper steps to take or what were the unconventional unconventional routes that successful people took in order to get to where they are. So one, I think this is important because of how exactly you got your start. Uh, two, I think it's important that, I think a lot of Armenians don't understand what an advantage we have with our culture, with our history and how we can use that here. Um, that really separates us from the crowd because it's so hard to break into the industry, but whether it be music or movies, when you use cultural elements into whatever global project you're doing, it immediately sets you apart and it becomes more interesting. System of a Down did that with the music, you did that with your film, and right away you already have an audience in this really saturated market that sets you apart and you're able to get your start with views and with people noticing your work. And I think the third reason that this is really significant is because it shows how you were able to be self-sufficient. You don't have to rely, when you have YouTube, you have these different social media platforms and most people have iPhones. You don't have to rely on other people or on people discovering you in order to have a chance to make it in the industry. And you don't have to have a rich uncle as you've said. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Like that is that is so true. Um, by the way, you should be teaching this in a class, like literally like the way you just talked about cultural specificity and like having a built an audience like it's incredible. Um, can I show you something really cool, by the way? So for we, we swing the movie at Glendale High School. And uh, this is, again, 2008. And I imagine some people may have even been there uh, when here, check this out. Um, can I share my screen? Is, is this is this allowed? It's allowed. I just don't know how to do it. Yeah. Do uh, do if it? you just go to security at the bottom okay. and just do allow share. Enable waiting room. Allow participants to share screen. Okay. Okay. So this is this is this is pretty crazy. Like just to give an example, like 
what a production this was. This is a picture of my dad putting together the movie screen. Wow. That we ended up like literally projecting the movie onto. Isn't that crazy? This is so cool. Like that was the operation. Like there was no money there. We can only rent a movie theater screen. Like we literally were like, okay, my mom helped sew it. My dad and his friends, we put it together at the gym and we literally brought it there. And just like, it was like, it was that kind of like operation. So it's like, we leaned into at least, you know, the cultural specificity of our thing. And for Armenians, like they were hungry for, for stuff that was for them. You know, like, like if you're an Armenian family, you want to have, have a fun weekend. You, those little videos you used to watch on YouTube, there's a movie that's worth $12 at the same time. You know, I made a movie for so little money because I was able to ask, hey, can I shoot in your restaurant? Like, what is it? I'm making a little Armenian movie. Oh, come on in, like for free. Like, you know, like um, anything I needed, I was able to get. And even just the, the fact that my parents were willing to help because in their minds, like, you know, they want to support their kids. But this is just a cool thing. Like, it's not like I was saying, hey, I'm making this like, I don't know, like violent like, you know, gangster movie. It was like, hey, I'm making a movie about an Armenian family, which is ridiculous and funny, but it also has a heart. So I think you're absolutely right. And I really do think you should be teaching this stuff in like the university. This is my version of teaching. I do this because I really hope that if that's the one thing that people can take away from these episodes, I hope that they learn um, to really be just empowered by, by everyone else's experiences because it really shows that things that seem impossible um, are actually not, not really so difficult. It's not as difficult as it seems. And we have a lot of resources as Armenians that we take for granted. It's, it's exactly as you said, you know, we, you have family members helping you. We're able to go to Armenian restaurants and Armenian stores and say, hey, can you help me out? And a lot of people don't have that culturally the way that we do. And it, it's something that we really need to recognize, appreciate, and used to our advantage to be successful. Well said. So you taught at USC as well, yes? Yeah, I did, uh, which is crazy. So I, I, you know, right after that movie came out, the Armenian movie, I applied to USC and I got in, in the graduate program. <clears throat> and when I was at SC, I really fell in love with the idea of producing movies, like rather than directing them. And my goal was to graduate and be an assistant to a producer and work my way up. And a, the year, the year I was graduating, a student who had graduated the year before me named Ryan Kugler reached out because he had just set up a movie that he was going to write and direct as a full length movie right out of school. And it was so impossible for that to happen, but he genuinely was that good of a, of a filmmaker in school. And he had real producers, he had the funding, but he wanted to bring on younger producers, people that kind of would have his back and creatively be on the same page as him. And he and I had never worked together on any projects, but we didn't know of each other. He knew of me from other students and other professors, and I got asked to help, to help out with that. So, you know, I produced that movie. It was called Fruitvale Station. It was a, you know, low budget indie film. We had a makeup artist this time. It was not me. And, uh, and the movie did really well. It starred Michael B. Jordan. It was kind of like his first leading man role. We went to Sundance. We went to the Cannes Film Festival in France, which was crazy for like my first real movie. And in the years after that, I started producing a bunch of like very, very small, low budget indie films that I was often like a junior producer on. I was a co-producer. I was, I was what you call a line producer, which is somebody who just helps with the budget and stuff. And around that time, I got a call from USC who I was very tight with, you know, having, having gone there as a student. And it was like almost Christmas time. And they said, hey, we have a winter semester starting in one week or like right after New, <clears throat> right after New Year's we had a professor who just had to drop out because of a family emergency. Like, would you want to come and fill in for him? And I was like, I've only been out of school for two years, but like fill in for the day, for the semester, like what's the deal? And it was literally for the entire semester. And it was genuinely because I think USC was probably really desperate. I'm sure they called like 20 other people and got a bunch of no's, but what they just said, it was like, you know, you're, you're, you know, relatively new out of school, but you've done a lot, a lot of cool stuff. And this is a junior class. And so I said, yes, like not really even realizing how I was going to pull it off. And it was amazing. Like, it was so cool. It ended up being four and a half years. I taught 300 students, like, I don't know how many classes. And it was always tough juggling, like producing stuff and traveling while, you know, making these movies, but it all worked out. And I, uh, it was amazing. And it was, I never saw myself doing that at least, at least not at such an early stage in my career, but you know, it's like just looking at you, like I think, and to what you're saying, like it's really rewarding to be able to give back and 
honestly, like, I think you learn how to do something better when you're forced to teach people anyway. So it was ultimately an amazing, amazing experience. That's so cool. Okay, so you made the YouTube videos, then you went to USC, and mm -hmm. then you taught at USC. And then what was the next step after that? So I was, you know, I was lucky enough that I was able to work on all these really cool indie films. And I was very like calculated in the movies I was, I wanted to do like a Christian faith-based movie. I wanted to do a Chinese Mandarin language movie. I wanted to do very purposefully things that were not your typical movies so I can really get a good range of like what's possible. But I was always like this junior producer. Like I wasn't the one who was leading the vision and I wasn't necessarily even making the projects that I wanted to make. And so often I would have like notes and like, hey, we should do this instead of that. And, you know, I wasn't necessarily getting listened to because that wasn't really my role in these projects. So I kept my head down. I worked really hard. I, I spent that time building relationships and really impressing people and going far and above what I should have been doing. But what I was really trying to. Sorry. And how were you getting gone to these projects? Oh, well, that's a great question. Uh, it was really just reputation. Like, I think with Fruvel doing as well as it did, a lot of people were asking who, like, was the guy or girl that really made that movie happen. I was lucky that enough people involved often pointed to me, and I would just start getting, you know, people reaching out, hey, I have a project that shoots here and here, like, I have a script, I don't have a director, we have some money, not all the money, like, and it was, it was really cool, like, these were not the highest paying jobs, like, in fact, they just were not, period, <laughs> it was not big budget it was nothing glamorous about it. it was often here's a headache do you want to join and I'd be like sure I'll take that headache and but I loved it because it was <clears throat> it was hard work but it was rewarding because I was able to see you know we went to festivals we sold the movies but I still wasn't quite fulfilled and I think a lot of it was I wanted I just could always feel that I wanted to make something that was more for the populace like I wanted to make mainstream movies that wide audiences could enjoy and these indies we were making were like maybe ending up on Netflix and they were doing well, but they weren't really catching a mainstream wide audience at all. So then I realized that I was never really going to get those scripts because if you have an amazing script, you're going to get it to like the biggest people you can get it to. And I realized I had to write that script. So I'd always loved writing. Um, you know, I'd written my big family and family, obviously. <clears throat> but my writing partner was a guy named Anish Chaganti and I, we, you know, we met at USC. I was his TA in one of his classes. And right after my first time I went to Sundance with Fruvel, he and I had drinks. And he was like, Seb, I've been developing a couple of projects. Can I pitch you five projects that I want to write? He pitched me the five projects. One of them I loved. I was like, bro, that's an amazing project. And he's like, you'll never believe this. That's my favorite project. And I was like, no way, like amazing. And then little like you know sooner than you know eventually he and i started writing that movie together we just started writing together years later sona he and i were like on a press tour like in hong kong somewhere and they asked us hey can you guys tell each other something you never told each other before and i was like anish i'll just tell you i really love you like a brother you're like blah 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 and he was like sev you know that day when i pitched you those five projects and i chose and you said that one was your favorite and i said it was my favorite so we ended up writing it together i was like yeah he's like whichever one you had said was your favorite I was going to say was my favorite I was like what he literally like our entire relationship was built on a lie but that project we started writing together was a really fun cheesy like four quadrant big budget movie called Animal Heist which we've never made yet by the way although I guarantee we will make it but it was a really fun heist movie about these thieves trying to steal a gorilla from the LA Zoo to save its life and we were so obsessed with it and I remember I was at some USC ASA event a few weeks later as, as Anish and I were writing it. And it was like all of the, like, you know, students from USC, like getting, getting together. And there was a really cute girl there that I wanted to impress. And she wanted to be a filmmaker, she said. So I was like, can I pitch you the story that I'm writing? And I pitched her, started pitching her Animal Heist. Halfway through the pitch, she interrupted me rudely. And she was like, I know how that pitch. And then she, she pitched it back to me. She's like, oh, and then this is going to happen. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. I was like, do you know Anish? Like, how do you know this? And she just was that clever at storytelling and she was that bold enough to interrupt me and her name is Natalie and she and I are now married <laughs> like all these years later so uh, and we work together all the time but basically uh, at around the time of me producing all these indies I was making like very little money like I'm not gonna lie I was at a point where like I was genuinely considering leaving the industry because it just the amount of hours was not equaling the amount of like money that I was not making like I came this close to considering a job in which I would produce YouTube videos 
that were makeup tutorial videos. Like, have you seen these videos on YouTube of like girls just teaching you how to apply whatever? But you will not believe how much money there is in those videos. Because literally there was a sound stage in which it was designed to look like multiple different like bathrooms, bedrooms, whatever. They're not real though. And they would bring these girls in and the Revlon or whatever would pay them a lot of money for the girl to just pretend she's in her mom's bathroom. Oh, and I just picked this up at the store. It's amazing. Even though it's basically an ad. And they were like, you'll said, you'll produce those. And they were offering me like six figures, stocks, health insurance. And I was like, damn, should I just do this for the rest of my life? Like, it would be amazing. But right around that time, I got one more script. And Natalie was like, you got to do this indie. So I went to Texas, I shot that indie. And then that snowballed. And eventually, Anish and I started writing something called Searching, which is a computer thriller, like kind of looks like what we're doing now about a father searching for his missing daughter. And he decides to go onto her laptop and try and find information about where she might be. But in the process, he learns things about her that he never imagined he'd learn. We ended up selling that. I got paid to write it. I was the lead producer finally. Now he produced it with me. Anish was his first time directing. And, uh, you know, even the way we made that, it's like we, we kind of pitched it as a short film and they were like, we want to make this a movie. Anish said, no. I said, he means no problem. Like, we're not going to give this opportunity up. Long story short, we made that movie for $800,000. That was our budget, which is not a lot of money in, in, in these, obviously. And it made 75 million, which was like insane because it was finally the first time like I was able to lead the creative on a project. And like when I said we should do X, people were like, let's do X instead of like, no way. And it was so satisfying to really finally see like, man, like we do have this ability to tell, you know, and it won a bunch of awards and it got a lot of accolades and good reviews, but we can tell stories that the wide audiences can genuinely enjoy. And if it's interesting, can I show you guys, can I show you how we pitched it just in case it's helpful to you? Absolutely. So this is, I'm just trying to take advantage of this, of the Zoom format, because we can't normally do this if you're in person, right? And I'm so, just learning now, but <laughs> like this is right? yes. Oh, uh, hell yeah. That's, okay, so check it out. This is how we okay this is how we pitched searching initially when it was just going to be a short film okay so it was literally a very short pdf we just put the title here this is the log line a desperate father tries to find his kidnapped daughter by hunting for clues on her laptop computer and then we had one page that kind of gives you the story you know, like we just kind of explain, you know, open a laptop, blah, 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 searching for clues, blah, 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 she was missing, blah, 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 a little bit of imagery. And then, you know, a little bit about the tone, blah, 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 blah. It's very simple, very minimal, and a little bit about Anish and I were writing it. That's it. That was, that was the entire of it. We just, but we, we, we knew that if we can sell the short story in just a few pages, you can get the vision. So when they asked us, hey guys, can you please pitch it as a movie and eventually convince Anish to do it? we ended up developing it to this thing. So this is the same, you know, style obviously, but now it was a movie. So we opened with the log line. And then what we did with this pitch, you know, this is 18 pages. We actually take the reader through the entire experience of the movie in the same style that the movie is gonna be. So you're getting a sense of, you know, this is how the movie opens. We have like all the, like all the images are conveying the time period and we're being very emotional in our writing until mom passes away. Um, we get into like the present day. And then when we realize he's gonna have to go on our laptop, boom, it's like overwhelming. And like you're understanding as you're reading this thing, like the people who are putting this together, I've covered the spoilers, the people who are putting this together, like, you know, we have a sense of style. We know how to give it gravitas and make it proper. And what the theme is gonna be, what the tone's gonna be, the style, what the real life inspirations were. So, you know, we didn't mess around. And then beyond that, the financiers were like, okay, this is a cool story, but can you guys actually pull this off? And they're like, we'll give you like, you know, prove to us that you guys actually have what it takes to like make this style make sense. So then um, we made a proof of concept and we did this entirely just by like taking pictures and animating it on our computers, like showing like, this is the style is gonna be like this. Um, it's fun, you could see me on Facebook back in the day, um, literally conveying like, it's gonna have like this feel and like, it's gonna be a thriller. We took real news footage. And they were like, okay, cool. We're like, okay, can we get the money now? And they said, nope, but here's $2,000, prove it to us again. So then we had to go and shoot something else. 
So again, this time we took the money and we started shooting something like that. Like, you know, we, we took a new we same deal with the, with the, with the, you know, like with the images. Uh, oh, wow. That's another picture of me. I just saw it's so embarrassing. I'm literally going to go back to it. Anyway, we, and then this time we actually got a real action. Today for missing San Jose resident, Margo West, who was last seen leaving Evergreen High School in a 2012 blue on this nada. We live our lives on screens, David. If your kid isn't coming home, show them each and every snap, text, and email they send. How well do you even know your daughter? Margo West? You do know she quit five months ago. What would you guys do when you spent time together? I don't know, Mr. West. Shop? Well, she clearly wasn't telling you something. A terrifying development today is a vehicle matching that of missing teen Margo West was discovered under a California lake inside. So, so like the idea Car, like, no excuse me, sorry. So the idea is like we wanted to really convey like this is going to be cinematic and theatrical. And finally, after all those hurdles, we got the green light. We were able to make the movie. We fought really hard to cast John Cho, who's a, you know, Korean American actor. And Oftentimes we were being asked like, why, why is he Korean? Why is the character actually Korean? We would only respond with why not? You know, like me being Armenian, Nali being Armenian, Anish being Indian, like we just never see people of color in these kinds of roles. And, you know, while I think it's important to tell stories about people of color, like, you know, about those communities, I also think it's really important to just tell stories sometimes where it's somebody of color who's just in a regular role, like to normalize it. And, um, you know, it was exciting because we, in the movie itself, in, in searching, like, uh, it's funny, I showed you a picture of my dad. Uh, let me show you, uh, let me show you one more thing too. With my mom. Uh, sorry, so maybe your editor can cut through some of this stuff. No, no, it's good. It's very interesting. I hope, I hope the show and tell is interesting. It's actually very interesting. I think it's much more educational and informative this way because yeah. anyone who wants to follow in your footsteps they'll kind of get an idea um of what to do i'm actually going to ask you something after show me the photo of your mom okay cool cool, cool. so this is a, so this is a so i showed you a photo earlier of my dad this is in the movie searching the character's trying to find out where his daughter is and he realizes that she has piano lessons and we had to put a picture of a piano lady and of course for the piano lady we use my mom. <laughs> so it was nice to have an Armenian, you know, using her maiden name in here. Anyway, uh, that's it for the show and tell for now. Such a beautiful Armenian woman too. <laughs> Thanks. So when initially when you said that you were pitching before they asked you to pitch it as a movie, who were you pitching to? A great question. So even getting into that pitch took years just to be able to get into that position. I, um, when I was at USC, I really wanted to make a reputation as the guy that would produce anything. Two students out of USC were trying to make a short film, like with a budget of like $5,000 that they would direct and use it to show that they could be good directors. I was down to make it because they were going to go to Utah. And I was like, oh, I want to have that experience of making something in a different state. So I went, I, made, I produced a short and I did you know, a really good job. One of the other producers that they had brought on, uh, Later, you know, I, I was kind of like always an independent producer. I never really had a job. I never worked for anybody. I was kind of my own boss. This other person was far smarter than me and got hired somewhere and didn't have to be her own boss. And she was getting health insurance and salary. She worked at a company called Baslevs. And Baslevs had produced a movie called Unfriended that was similar on computers and it had made a lot of money. And around this time, Anish and I made a short film called Seeds that takes place entirely on Google Glasses, if you remember this from like a couple of years back. And they were awful, but we were trying, we, we made a short for very little money and the short blew up and it kind of like, it got went on the news. I was on the news on Bloomberg, which is crazy. Like, and each got hired at Google and it kind of is this awesome thing. And this girl reached out to me saying, hey, we want to make a short film on a computer screen. And she had seen that our short was really cool. Like it's really emotional. And it was, you know, shot using these glasses. So it's already kind of experimental. She's like, you guys might be right for making a short film on a computer screen. So when we, we saw that opportunity, we're like, cool, we'll pitch a short. And they were impressed that our idea they felt and they were right was better than what a short film should be. Like it could be a long movie, it can make money, it can make people cry. And that's how we got it. So it was really, I, I had the experience 
of having worked with this person on a film set for very little money. Like most people probably would not have taken that job. I got paid nothing to go make the short. Um, and then beyond that, I think people often talk about Hollywood is all about who you know. I really disagree. And I think Hollywood's all about who knows you. Because in that sense, we had then made Anisha and I this other thing, the Seeds video on Google Glass. When that blew up, everyone kind of heard about that. So they wanted us. Like we didn't have to go, hey, look at our glass video. Let us come pitch for you guys. They were like, hey, we saw your glass video. Will you come pitch for us? So I think it was a combination of all of these steps. And when we and when we were even when we pitched the short, the reason that they were comfortable giving us that eight hundred thousand dollars, obviously after we jumped through all those hurdles and proved that we can make a good movie, was also because they saw that I had already produced like seven movies at that point, like low budget movies that I wasn't in charge of, but that experience all culminated in like this perfect storm. Uh, you know, and sadly, I don't think Hollywood is necessarily the kind of place for like, hey, I want to make a movie and like, they'll come up and write it or produce it or direct it. Like, it's not that easy. Like, I think for me, it's, you know, I graduated from film school in 2012. So it's been like almost what, nine years now of just consistently working and delivering and always leaving a good reputation. So people always, you know, speak kindly about you. And eventually I think all of that adds up and creates essentially your reputation. But how do you make those projects visible? Because you can make something really great, but people have to be able to see it. So how do you, how are you able to make noise where people find out about you and recognize you? How does Bloomberg end up writing yeah. about you? Totally. So that's a great question too. And, and it, all of it comes down to like capitalizing on these opportunities. So one, so the, the glass thing I'll talk to you about right now. Um, and just so you, just so you see what I'm talking about. I love that you're asking these questions, by the way. And I think this is so helpful to your audience. I love that you're answering them. <laughs> I think that's sure, for sure. For sure. Sorry. Apologies. I'm just a little bit catching this stuff so so just for context okay so seeds i'm just going to play like a very little bit about it So, you know, it's a little bit of a spoiler there, but what happened was Google Glass, Google had made these, these glasses that were going to have cameras on them. And they wanted to prove that those glasses could be viable filmmaking tools. They were not. Regardless, they, they didn't know how to prove it. You know, like they, they, didn't, they knew real filmmakers wouldn't waste their time playing with those things. They would want to give them to students or recent alumni. They reached out to six film schools in America, USC, NYU, like somewhere in Toronto actually, like, and they said, hey, here's a pair of glasses. Can you give it to your alumni and have them make a tech demo? A tech demo is basically just, you know, walking around in the light, walking around the night, walking around with lighting, walking around and like on a motorcycle, like, and then showing that footage and being like, look, look how amazing the quality is and everything. USC asked me to produce it. And again, it was literally because, you know, and, you know, I just graduated and I think all the teachers knew of me as the guy who was making cool stuff. And like, there was like, oh, Seth can do this. I got paid $0 to do this. But I was like, yo, like, that's an interesting proposition because Google's a huge brand. And that's, I love the idea that it's something experimental. And when we were making it, USC had actually, and this is a lot of the stuff we haven't talked about until recently, but USC was insisting that we make a heavy metal music video. I don't know why, like, but the idea was like, oh, that'll be a lot of lights. It'll be kind of cool. And Anish was, you know, who's my writing partner, who I brought on to direct. He didn't want to make that. And he was like, yo, I came up with this really cool idea. We only had a budget of $2,000. And he's like, yo, what if I take my parents travel miles on their credit card and fly to India? I'm like, that's cool. So like we can have a journey of somebody. It's a story now. It's not just a demo. It's a narrative. Somebody flying across the world to deliver something. I'm like, what is he delivering? And we came up with that 
really cool concept that it's somebody delivering a, a letter, which is ultrasound of his newborn baby to his mom. Like, I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And, and we're like, oh, we can do it with no dialogue. So like people around the world can watch this and genuinely fall in love and universally understand the story. So we pitched that to USC and we're like, yo, let's do this instead. And they said, no, they're like, it's gotta be the heavy, heavy metal music video. And we were like, why? Like, it made no sense. And, and it was a little bit of bureaucracy, a little bit of politics. And we're like, look, we'll do that. And we'll do this. We'll do this with our own money. And they said, no. And we were not in touch with Google directly. Like when they would forward us the emails, they would take out Google's email so we could never contact them directly, which is so lame. And we were like, dang, I guess we got to make this have a music video. But I knew in my heart of hearts that video was not going to be good. So I start, and we were just watching House of Cards that summer. This is like 2014. So we were kind of like assholes at the time. And we, I started telling the heavy metal music video band, they're like a small band. I was like, Hey guys, for our shooting day, we're going to have 15 hours of work that day. And the guy was like, really? I'm like, yep, we need to do it. He's like, all right. I'm like, by the way, it's going to be indoors and there's no AC. He's like, you can't bring a fan. I was like, sorry, man, no budget. I was like, Hey, by the way, they got to wear fur coats. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah. Well, by the way, can they help us move the equipment too? And then I don't know what happened to him, but the next day, the, the band dropped out. I don't know why. It was crazy. So I go to you see the guys, like the band dropped out. This is crazy. I think we got to do this, this other thing now. And you were like, okay, fine. I was like, trust me, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> then they're like, okay, but you have to have dialogue. You have to have spoken words. And we're like, why? They're like, we want to test the audio on this device. I was like, bro, like if we have dialogue, it ruins it. Like, because now if you're in Bangladesh, you won't understand this. Or if you're in like Kuwait, like you don't understand what's going on. So he's like, you have to have it. So we obviously only had enough money for Anish to fly. When he got there, he sent me an email in India saying, Seb, I have horrible news. The microphone broke. It's not recording any sound. I was like, oh no, can you go to Radio Shack? He's like, I'm in India, there's no Radio Shack. So we're like, I forward the, I'm like, hey, USC, look at these emails, it sucks. We'll just shoot it and maybe we'll add the dialogue later. He was, he was like, fine. We come, he comes back, we edit this video and it's like honestly amazing. It's three and a half minutes, but it makes you, it's, it's adventurous, it's thrilling. It makes you cry at the end. We showed to USC and they're like, it's whatever. It's kind of cheesy. We're like, really bro? Like, why are you guys hating? And then we realized something. Mother's Day was in six days. Like we just realized it's May, whatever. Like Mother's Day is coming up. Can you send this to Google? And say, hey guys, screw this tech demo thing. Why don't you guys put this on your YouTube channel for Mother's Day? And they were like, no. We're like, like literally, we're like, it was so odd. It was so frustrating that they wouldn't send to Google. And again, we didn't have Google's information. So we went on Facebook and we literally, like, you could just advanced search my friends who work at Google. We had no friends who work at Google. Like, you could like type in employer Google, but we found this one girl in our class who was dating a guy who worked at Google and it was Friday and mother's day was like that following Thursday or whatever, or Sunday, we hit her up. We're like, Hey, would you be down to have dinner with Anish and I? And she was like, I have a boyfriend. And we're like him too. <laughs> like, please. She's like, when we're like tonight. So we took her and her boyfriend out to dinner in downtown and Anish had his iPhone. I had my headphones. We're like, Hey, you work at Google. Why don't you watch this? We gave him the headphones. He watched this video. And when you finish watching it, he didn't, he didn't talk. And we're like, did you like it? He's like, can I watch it again? We're like, yeah. He watched it. He's like, guys, this is phenomenal. And he's like, what does Google think? We're like, you're Google now. <laughs> like, you tell us. He's like, I think it's amazing. He's like, he's like, can I show my bosses on Monday? And we were like, sure. But can you do it now? Like, why wait until Monday? So he showed his bosses. Google immediately called us. We're like, who the F are you guys? This is amazing. Can we put it on our channel? We're like, absolutely. And they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We should clear this by USC. Are they okay with it? And we were like, they absolutely are okay with it. No problem. So then, so then basically the day before Mother's Day, uh, we, uh, here, I'm going to quickly type something. The day before Mother's Day, we got a call from USC and it was, uh, they were very unhappy with us because they, um, one quick second like you know they were very unhappy with us because they were like hey this video is about to go online what how what happened how can we know about this and we we're like oh we thought you did sorry 
And they were like, you can't do this. And we're like, sorry, sorry. And then we realized, wait a minute, we've already graduated from USC. Like, we're not going to get expelled. Like, what, what's the worst they can do? The video goes online and it blows up. It gets tons of views, tons of articles. Uh, here's, here's uh, I'll show you guys another thing right now. This is a, uh, this is an, this is an article on Bloomberg. Of course, the ad's playing. Treasure can cut through this. Well, I'll show you later. But basically, the, the video blows up. I'm literally on Bloomberg TV now talking about this thing. Google hires a niche that weekend to work and direct their commercials. And of course, USC loves it. They're like, this is amazing. We did this. It was amazing for us. Like, and it was, and I think they still show this video like at USC graduation stuff. So even the fact that this video was like big enough that like to answer your question, how did that company even know about it? It was because genuinely we had to fight tooth and nail. We had to lie. We had to cheat. We had to do everything we could because we really believed in this concept and we knew it was going to be good. The problem is we didn't have enough weight at that time. Like we couldn't just say this is what we want to do. We had to fight for it. And eventually, you know, like luckily we're kind of at a place now where we don't have to fight as hard, but you still have to fight. And I think the lesson to take away there is if you genuinely have a vision, like don't let someone give you permission to do it. Like find a way to do it if you think it'll be good. That is so, so cool. I think for me, the most fascinating part of all of the success stories is the strategy because there has to be some sort of strategy most of the time. And it's half the talent, I think, because you could be really talented in songwriting and filmmaking in directing in so many different things. But if you don't have that strategic mindset, it's so hard to make anything work. Then it doesn't really, you can never really execute your dreams. So I think that is so awesome. Thank you. Okay, so this last story, then jump to you are a producer on a project that gets nominated for six, I was gonna say Grammy Awards, for six Oscars and wins two, two Oscars. So how do you make the leap from that project to working on an Oscar nominated film? Yeah, I mean, the same thing happened with Fruvel. I got a call from Ryan Coogler. So when, when we had made Fruvel together, Ryan went off to direct movie called Creed, which is a really amazing movie to spin off of the Rocky boxing movies. And I went off to do all these indies. We kept in touch. And around the time that he was working on Black Panther, uh, we were talking and he was like, hey man, like, would you ever want to start a company together? And I was like flattered and, and like blown away by the concept because I had always kind of loved the idea of not really having a company and just kind of doing my own thing. But the more we spoke about it, the more I realized that like the vision that Ryan had and what ended up becoming our collective vision was something that would be a little bit different. And we ended up forming a company called Proximity Media back in 2018, which is like right when Black Panther came out, right when Searching was coming out, but we never really announced it. We kind of kept a low profile. And, you know, over the past couple of years, we've spent a lot of our time working hard on uh, a couple of movies, one of which was Judas and the Black Messiah. And it was a project that Ryan brought to us from a friend of his named Shaka King, uh, who had written this incredible, incredible movie which was extremely like event driven. It was an undercover cop gritty thriller about the Black Panther Party, the real Black Panther Party, which, you know, I consider myself fairly well educated. And I don't, and I think our education system has genuinely failed us because the true story has been warped through propaganda and just changed and sullied. And here was an opportunity to tell a really fun audience friendly movie that couldn't have the potential to expose people to the truth about stuff. So. We spent a long time working on that movie. And, you know, I was on set in Cleveland, Ohio for many, many months. And we work with the real life descendants and survivors of the tragic events of that movie. And, you know, I was on set and I was watching Daniel Kaluuya play Chairman Fred Hampton. And I was like, I've never felt this in my life. And I was like, oh, that man's gonna win an Oscar, like straight up. Like you could just feel his, his performance. And it was amazing. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of politics with Oscars as I learned very early on that like, not always the best movies win and sometimes there's other things going on but I do like to think in our case a really good movie won and, and the people who won the award which is Daniel and her the, the HER the musical artist like more than deserved it and and I'm just happy that our, our film that we worked so hard on you know got the recognition that it needed. You 
and your wife, Natalie, had some major success at the Sundance Film Festival as well. Can you tell us oh, about yeah. that? Uh, if you're talking, you know, we, we both were given the producer's award, uh, me in 2018 and her in 2021, which is crazy. Uh, it's, it's an, speaking of producers, it really is, a, is an award that Sundance does to genuinely recognize hardworking producers who, like you said, sometimes don't necessarily get the credit. So it's been, it's been amazing. So like, honestly, Sundance has been so good to us. Like when I was growing up and thinking about doing film, like Sundance was like this foreign, crazy big entity. And now it's like a second home, you know, like it's, it's amazing. So how do you get a project into Sundance? It's tough. Like literally I've been lucky to have five movies there. The last one was Judas, which was a Warner brothers movie. So the reason that got in is because it was already going to be a theatrical release and Sundance always saves a couple of slots for like the big studio movies. The second to last one was Searching, which was a really random movie because it's like an audience friendly thriller that's not artsy fartsy, like your typical what you would consider as a Sundance prestige movie. And I think that one got in purely just based on how innovative it was. Um, before that, I had a movie that was by a filmmaker that had already been at Sundance. Before that, I had a film by a actress turned director. And I think the movie of mine that's probably like the most purest movie that got into Sundance is Fruvel, which Ryan had directed. You know, it had Octavia Spencer as a, as a supporting character who had recently won an Oscar. And I think that stuff helps. I think I like to think Sundance takes the best movies every year, but you can't deny that the best movies sometimes are the ones that have big name actors. So it's really, really tough. If you're making a movie with your friends and like you want to get in Sundance, it's going to be a harder challenge. But at the same time, I do think it's possible. Um, I don't think you have to get your movie into Sundance to make it. I think, again, like I, my biggest recommendation for anyone trying to enter this industry is don't try and do everything at once. Like if you have a dream project, which I have my dream projects, I still haven't made those because in my mind, I'm taking my time and I want to get to a level where when I say this is the dream project, people are like, here's some money. You know, like, so I think my recommendation is like, do what, whatever you can to get your foot in the door work on other people's projects, accumulate credits, accumulate experiences, make relationships to get to the point that when you start doing your own stuff, like people will, will take notice. And, and, you know, like had I made seeds with a niche, but I hadn't already spent so many years working on other people's movies and, and building credits, that company may not have said, hey, what's your short film? Or maybe they would not have said, hey, we want to make your short into a feature. They might've said, cool, make a short film. Like, we, you know, you haven't proven you're doing anything better. So you know, to get your movie in Sundance, make the best movie you can and submit it. And if it doesn't get in, no worries, make another movie. So going back to pitching again, which I don't think we finished talking about that. Sure. Um, when you were asked to actually pitch as a film, and I was asking, who do you pitch to? Do you pitch because you're trying to get financing for the film or who are you pitching to as a filmmaker? Uh, usually it's production companies that... Um, it's usually, uh, you know, like a company that's designed that, you know, they have a pre-existing deal with a bigger entity like a studio and they have fun, they have financing that they want to use to, you know, make projects. They'll have executives who work there, people that either went to film school or they used to be directors or producers or actors who are now working here. Um, and, you know, their job is to listen to and read hundreds of pitches a year and they'll choose the best ones and then they'll, you know, move that up the ladder to their boss and their boss and eventually like only like like top five will ever survive so you know you're usually pitching to somebody who it's their job to listen to pitches all day long so it's so important that your pitch is on point you're demonstrating that you understand story immediately you're not rambling you're not trying to like i think sometimes people use too much personality in lieu of a good story and if you have a great story you just can just conversationally like tell the story not have to try and be flashy or whatever i think you know some people will tend to overdo the visuals and lean on that too much and like like i hopefully like i showed you like those are the visuals that i think like just simply tell the story in a nice stylized way that's not distracting from the story and yeah and i think it's something that you have to i mean when i was starting off trying to be a pitcher i used to force myself every single day after pitch to five strangers so i would be that annoying guy in the starbucks line ma'am, can I, can I, can I tell you an idea for a movie? And she'd say, okay. And I'd be like, blah, 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 blah. And I, I can, she starts smiling. I'm like, okay, cool. She liked that. And then sometimes I'd be like, oh, that person hated that pitch. I'm like, what did I do wrong? Like, what can I do better? And eventually you just get comfortable.
That's interesting. How do you protect your ideas though? Because there's one project that I worked on, put two years of my life into this project. We pitched to various uh, production companies. They turned down the project. And then Oof. months later, we see that pretty much the same show is on TV and our project and is just dead. From one of those companies that you pitched to? Yeah. Oh man, well, I always follow up with an email. Thank you so much for the opportunity today to pitch you guys searching. It was like, we love, we love this amazing story about a father searching for his missing daughter because it's so emotional for us. Let us know what you guys think. So I always have a paper trail. I can't guarantee that that person will not steal my idea, but I can guarantee that if they do, I will have the receipts I need to prove it in a court of law. So I always, always find some classy way to bring up the concept of the story. You know, I don't just say, let me pitch searching. Let me pitch this story about an emotional father, daughter. Like, I'm just making sure that, hey, your, your honor, you can see right here. <laughs> That's my idea. Do you have a crazy hard lesson that you've learned in the industry? Oh my God, I have so many. <laughs> um, but uh, not for today. I think we should save that for the next one. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, and finally, for someone who wants to follow in your footsteps, what advice would you give um, and what would you, this is kind of a loaded question, but what do you think are the most important talents of an aspiring filmmaker? Um, the most important talent is, is work ethic, like genuinely work ethic. It, it is, I, I don't have any superpowers. If I had one, it's just that I do the job and you'd be surprised. I think this industry sometimes attracts people who think I don't want to work a real job. I want to go work in the film. Like if you're doing your job 12, 13 hours a day, whatever it takes, like you will see results. Um, and my biggest advice to anybody who wants to start off is do your homework. Like before you even reach out to anybody for advice, you should have read 30 books on filmmaking and you should read 300 scripts if you want to be a writer. Like 99% of people don't do either of those things and they start reaching out, trying to get advice, trying to get a job. Trust me, it costs very little money to just go to the library or even buy it on Amazon or buy used books. If you just consume that knowledge, you will put yourself so far above the millions of people in this country that are trying to do exactly what you're doing that very few of them actually do the reading, do the job. Self-education is so big. You do not need to go to USC. You just need to teach yourself. Um, I guarantee you the people who do that always make it. And the people that don't sometimes make it. Awesome. Seth John, thank you so much. This was so inspiring. And um, I learned so much. And I know that a lot of people will too. This was very cool. Thank My you. pleasure, son. Thank you for having me. This is this is awesome. I'm excited. You're going to be interviewing Natalie too, right? So I want to I want to stalk and see what you guys talk about. I was just going to say, I'm really looking forward to talking to Natalie as well. And a part of what's cool about doing this is when you talk to multiple filmmakers, there are some things that you see are different in their journeys, but there are always late motifs where you are just That's like, awesome. okay, this is a common theme in each person's story. And you really get to establish a pattern to success, which is- That's beautiful. Cool. That's beautiful.